It should not be the taxpayer alone who picks up the tab. We will wait for the inquiry to report to make clear the extent any other organisation's culpability for the scandal and for any individual accountability. Our aim is to ensure that every victim is fully recompensed for their losses and the suffering they have to, had to endure. Fujitsu, and I, I concur with his, his points, I think anybody who is shown to be responsible for this scandal should be held accountable, including uh, making any, uh, any uh, payments into the, uh, to the taxpayers' fund for that. It was, we now know, it's, it's the, the biggest miscarriage on this scale we've seen in British history. Yes, and it's incredible, really, how long it's taken for that outrage to completely boil over and, and basically raise this issue where it should have been a long time ago, right at the top of the political agenda at Westminster. And we heard the Prime Minister's spokesman today saying how utterly outraged the Prime Minister was, how he shared the public's outrage. And now, frankly, ministers are scrambling to try and f work out a way that's legally watertight that will satisfy the judges as well to sort this out, to get justice to people. Um, we heard from the minister there in the House of Commons, they're looking at a range of options, they're discussing that with the judiciary. I thought it was interesting, he said they were setting up an independent disputes panel to try and get make sure people get fair compensation quickly. I thought it was interesting he confirmed that the taxpayer shouldn't alone have to bear the yes. burden of the compensation bill, which was a clear indication that if, and it's an if, of course, at this stage, Fujitsu, who provided the Horizon system, are found culpable, that the government will be going after them to help pay for the compensation bill as well. So a lot of things in there, but still pretty much a holding statement, because I think ministers are still grappling with the technical issues around how you actually deliver this more speedily yeah. in the courts. Okay. The post of his scandal is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history, shaking people's faith in the principles of equity and fairness that form the core pillars of our legal system. I am very pleased that last week's excellent ITV drama, Mr Bates versus the Post Office, has brought an understanding of the Horizon scandal to a much broader audience. I have received much correspondence about the scandal and the emotional impact the dramatisation has had. I mean, Captain Leland, so, I don't, I mean, I don't know whether you, whether you applaud or whether you, you, you cry at the fact that a, a TV docudrama has, has needed to come along to put a light, on, a light of fire under this scandal, Cat. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people are sort of saying it's a sort of damning indictment on um, the media, but I'm I'm pretty relaxed about it because I think this is exactly what a, a TV drama does that is different to journalism. Um, journalism, you know, the journalists that have been working on this, that have helped uh, the sub postmasters to sort of reveal what has happened, have been working in increments, have been sort of, um, you know, dotted all around the country, um, trying to sort of get these stories together. And because it has happened over such an enormous span of time, time and um it's about sort of joining the dots it's one of those stories that i think a lot of people myself included were aware of and we were aware that it was a, a, a the, the sort of had been described as one of the biggest miscarriages of justice of, of, of in british history but it's not until you see the kind of human side of it yes. which you can't always get with with journalism you you don't get the sort of people suffering on their own and uh you know the kind of depths of despair that people felt and that's where a drama uh, really kind of helps to tell that side of the story. But of course, you wouldn't have the drama without some of the work that the journalists were doing yes. as well as the campaigners. Yeah. So I, I think it's all part of the same ecosystem. It, it just tells the story in a different way and brings it much more to home. Yeah, that is true, George, isn't it? I mean, the, uh, this story, this scandal has been covered in across the the media on hundreds, literally hundreds of occasions. And I will say, um, forgive me for this, but the Times has very much led the way on this investigation and pursuing the matter. Uh, 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 Tom Witherow, our own Tom Witherow, has been in the very forefront of, of recovering this story, but many other other journalists have been have been there. I guess if there's an indictment to be handed down, it's the way the, the TV uh, depiction of this story has seems to have galvanised politics mm. into the kind of responses that we're now seeing. Yes, I mean... I mean, this, when you're looking to apportion blame for this whole scandal, I mean, obviously, you need to start with the post office and the people who designed, potentially designed the, this faulty system. But it's a it's an unusual scandal, which it where blame has been apportioned to all the three main political parties. Yes. I mean, you, to Labour, who were in government when the scandal first arose, to 
Liberal Democrat ministers who were in the coalition serving as post office ministers for five years. And then, of course, onto the Conservative government, which was in power when this all started to come to light. And you're right. I mean, in the end, thanks, as Kat was saying, to investigative work by journalists, this scandal was brought to light. The government did act. It did recognise a scandal had taken place. It set up a compensation scheme and a legal process was set up. But really what this ITV drama has done amazingly well is just to sort of, as Kat said, galvanise public opinion behind the fact that, hang on, this still hasn't been sorted out. This is something which has been going on for the best part of 20 years. It's still unresolved. So it's not that systems weren't put in place to help people in the end, but it's the fact that they're still... It's such a laborious and slow legal process. And I think that will be the effect of the drama. That it will force ministers to actually take some very tough action to sort this out yeah. once and for all. Yeah, we heard Jonathan Reynolds there. And there are there are, there are you know, parliamentary colleagues on the other side of the House, I mean, David Davis, the former cabinet minister, I think just one of them, who is saying, look, when it comes to the legal niceties of getting these people clearly, finally, legally exonerated, just get it done. Mm. You know, just, 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 just declare that, that that is done and push maybe a, a kind of class action. Yeah. I mean, David Davis didn't go through the legal, the legal intricacies of this, but maybe just some kind of action in the courts that says, right, you're on this, this document... You are thereby deemed innocent. You are given the court's um, certific- certification that you are innocent, and that you don't. That, so you don't give out pardons, which were kind of forgiveness for crime, because there wasn't a crime. Yes, well, I think that's the the fine legal detail that ministers are now going to have to thrash out with the judiciary of how you actually affect that. But you heard there Jonathan Reynolds for the Labour Party saying that they would support legislation to provide this cover for all these people. And the, the campaign, the, the board that's overseeing the compensation claimers said that there may be a few instances where people had acted fraudulently who will be cleared, but that's a small price to be paid for sorting out yes. this massive injustice to the vast, vast majority of people caught up in this scandal. Well, well, indeed. And all the sort of crude politics of all of this, I mean, you, you make the point, George, that no party, no, none of the major parties can walk away from this with their head entirely high. Everyone had a share mm. of, a, of a hand or hand in overseeing this as the political master on, on the given day. But it's a new experience for the Liberal Democrats, you know, <laughs> for, to be in this spot. I mean, in the coalition government, they had this corner of government to themselves. Vince Cable was there. Um, uh, uh, Joanne Swinford was there. Mm. And of course, Ed Davey. Ed Davey was there. Who And, and poor old Ed Davey. I say poor old Ed Davey. <laughs> that's probably a wrong use of the word poor old. But it's a tough spot for Ed Davey to be in. I wonder how far it's going to come back to bite him. It's a, well, it's, a, it's a very serious problem for Ed Davey because, you know, it's an issue which has co- touched a nerve with the public in an unusual way, the way that political, political issues often don't. And, you know, the idea of him turning down meetings with Alan Bates, he did eventually meet him, incidentally, puts him in a difficult position and exacerbated by the fact that he's open to charges of hypo- hypocrisy because he's someone, Ed Davey, who routinely asks or calls for people to be sacked or to yeah. resign over various... Mis- which is what opposition politicians which do. Which is what they do yeah. in opposition. But, of course, if you've been in government, then you've got a record to defend. Mm-hmm. The only one thing I, the thing I would say in defence of Ed Davey is that he was the first minister to meet Alan Bates, and there were ministers before him in the Labour government who didn't meet Alan Bates, and there were ministers in the Conservative governments that followed the coalition who could be held equally culpable. So I think it's slightly unfair to point the finger entirely at Ed Davies sure. being responsible for it in the way that some people are. Yeah. And mind you, Kat, I wouldn't give much, would you, for the CBE of the former head of the post office right now? No, um, the petition has reached well over a million now. Um, you know, it only takes 100,000 um, uh, signatures on a petition for it to be debated on the floor of the House of Commons. Um, I, I think it would be... Unlikely in the in the extreme for there not to be some kind of uh, sort of wave of MPs uh, calling for for her to to give it up. You heard um, from the statement earlier that the suggestion that she might give it up voluntarily. I suspect there might be, if she doesn't give it up entirely voluntarily, some kind of uh, push, uh, a suggestion that if she doesn't at least be seen to be doing it um, yeah. out of her own free will, that um, it will be forced. Uh, but no, I, I should I wouldn't put money on her still having it by the end of this year. No, I don't think. I don't think any of us would, would, would do that either. I mean, what do you say about all this? If you're looking for an example of the mighty state at its most faceless, at its most heedless, its most heartless, you really don't have to look much further than this scandal. We've got hundreds of postmasters and postmistresses. And by the way, those titles, they conjure memories of an older time, 
of personal service to local communities. Some 700 of them falsely accused of fraud after this computer glitch. And then the prosecutions and the jailings and some of them tragically taking their own life. And all the while the post office lying and covering up and covering up again. While ministers, we now know, did little or nothing to see right done. And now after this TV dramatisation of this scandal, a scramble to address the injustice very publicly and, well, the promise is generously. And as we say, the head of the post office at the time may well lose her CBE. What is going to be done now? Well, beyond listening. <laughs> 